We have speaking for us this morning, Brother Skip Francis. I will say that Danny had me a little concerned in his prayer when he started praying for young Brother Francis. I was thinking, surely he can't be talking about Skip. Because <laughs> he's not a young Brother Francis. <laughs> Until he made that clarification. Uh, do appreciate having Sean with us this week. And he's got his daughter Mary as well. Uh, glad that Sean can lead singing and help out in this as we've had several who have uh, led singing during various lectures or prior to various lectures. We do have with us today Brother Skip Francis. Uh, Skip's been preaching the gospel for 23 years, has done local work in several different areas in the United States and Canada. Uh, Skip has done mission work in England, being involved in the England lectures, and he and I have had the privilege for I think at least three or four years to go over together and speak on those lectures. He's also an instructor with us, the Spring Bible Institute, or Truth Bible Institute. It used to be at one time Spring Bible Institute, but Truth Bible Institute. And he has done substitute teaching for his local school district. Skip has two Bachelor of Science degrees, one in management and one in computer information systems. He and his wife Kay have six children. Between them, six are Chris, Lisa, Kristen, Sean, Brian, and Mary. And as I mentioned, we have Sean and Mary with us today, and one grandchild. Skip is currently doing local work for the Grant Street Congregation in Liberal, Kansas. And as he pointed out yesterday, he's the only liberal preacher we got here. Uh, not in doctrine, but from the location in which he resides at this time. Look forward to having Skip come preach to us. Skip, come on. Thank John for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I don't know about the references to age, but we won't uh, get into too deeply into that. Uh, I want, also want to thank the preacher and fine elders here for uh, continuing to have these lectures that are so sorely needed in our day and time. And thank the cones. They've been putting up with me for about the last six years, so uh, they must be gluttons for punishment. It's the only thing I can conclude by that. <laughs> Uh, a reference to age is kind of interesting. About 12 days ago, my daughter Mary and I celebrated our joint birthday together, uh, her 18th. Uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of blessings that come with sharing a birthday, but there is one downside, at least for me. I've put up with the indignity of having 17 years of Barbie cakes for my, uh, <laughs> for my birthday. Now... This year, my daughter finally realized that that was a problem, and uh, she organized a birthday celebration for me at the church building and kind of a surprise party event, and, and, uh, and, and she made sure I didn't have a Barbie cake. Instead, my, my cake had a little hunter on it, and I've still got that hunter. She kept the deer, though. I'm not sure what the deal is with that, but uh, uh, I did want to mention that uh, for those of you who are interested, I was 63 this year, which means I'm still not as old as Dub. But, uh, and, and by the way, I'm not sharing my toy with Terry Hightower, no matter what, how much he begs me to. <laughs> <clears throat> Being born in, uh, prior to 1960 gives one a slightly different perspective on uh, current events. Uh, having been born in 1950, I have seen this nation and what it was like both then and now, and it has not progressed for the good. In my childhood, words like honor, respect, integrity, reputation, duty, morality, loyalty, courtesy, and code had different meanings than they have today. We grew up when Father knows best, we lived on the front porch and not the fenced-in backyard when those in need were cared for by the church and their neighbors and those who received charity really didn't want it. Those born after 1970 saw their first presidential election as adults when the winner admitted to smoking marijuana, committed adultery even before he was elected, often forgot by folks, and was in favor of both abortion and homosexuality. Though there have been times when there was a push back to some semblance of the past, these were often short-lived. 
Instead, we have now re-elected one of the least qualified presidents in modern times, who, while making a good speech now and again, has accomplished little to nothing while in office, and has led our nation down a path that presses us into moral degradation and seeks to erode our Constitution and, more importantly, the Bill of Rights. Those, those of us who are concerned about the Second Amendment have put a lot of focus on the gun issue. There are issues of more importance to us as Christians and should be. The recent election has honed my own thinking to a point where the subject of materialism and money, as it's addressed by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and it's my subject today, while I've asked myself why we are where we are as a nation, the only conclusion I can come to is this, and it was a hard conclusion for me. I would never have suggested that James Carville could be right about anything. But I have discovered that it is the economy stupid. That's best represented by the woman on YouTube that voted for Obama because he gave her a free phone. Our nation is too materialistic. The following words should be at least in part familiar to every patriotic citizen of these United States. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. These fine words, penned almost entirely by Thomas Jefferson, ring true to the cause of freedom. They accurately point out the role of government in the affairs of man and demonstrate the fine traditions that formed our own representative rule through the democratic process of a constitutional republic. Such process, however, was predicated on the notion that man would consistently recognize divine providence as the source of all our freedoms and that equality of opportunity would be the basis of man's successes and not equality of outcome. The Declaration of Independence and its subsequent sister, the United States Constitution, are the foundation from which all our freedoms stand. The assumptions made by the founders by these principles were all based on a people that considered themselves first and foremost a Christian nation and a recognition that individual freedom would only come through all citizens working together with that common goal. Looking back on the recent election, I cannot but wonder, as many have, if the founders and framers would recognize the America that we have wrought in modern times. When over 50% of Americans vote for entitlement without responsibility, would Mr. Jefferson see the country as the one that he helped to found? The fact is that the major reasons given by this electorate for their own exercise of the franchise have little to do with work, responsibility, or morality, nor life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness. Instead, our country voted for the legalization of recreational marijuana, making sodomy the equivalent of marriage, 
the continuation and expansion of the killing of our unborn by abortion, and anything that they believe government will give them free while making those who actually work pay for these things. This agenda is one of the most anti-moral and anti-Christian ever voted on by the American people. I, I was reading just this morning that Rush Limbaugh made a statement just yesterday telling, telling us that he is now ashamed of this country. And I would agree with that. Did Jesus have anything to say about these things? In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now that term mammon was defined by the eminent scholar Joseph Thayer, referring to the personification of riches. It seems that the vast majority of Americans voted with their pocketbook rather than with reference to the good book. I'm reminded of the words often attributed by, to, to Benjamin Franklin, who, when asked at the close of the Constitutional Convention, well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? And he responded with these words, a republic, if you can keep it. We have seen in this day of entitlement that our Constitution repeatedly and regularly gets trampled on as a, as a vastly uneducated electorate sacrifices its freedoms for one benefit or another. Such failure to appeal to the true authority of our land demonstrates the current mindset that suggests that our Constitution is a, quote, living document, unquote, and as such is so flexible, flimsy, and outdated, it is no longer relevant in today's world. I, for one, and I know Brother Gene Hill and probably some of you others here, five times stood up and raised my hand and took an oath that said, I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I'm heartbroken, and I'm angry because I see that document trampled by its domestic enemies in our own government today in order to feed the hungry mouths of entitlement. Sadly, the same entitlement attitude has also infected the Lord's church. Few today actually look to the Lord's will before engaging in all kinds of activities, and just assume it's going to be okay. Assume it's going to be acceptable to God. God will just have to accept anything we want to do. What we see is that a lack of respect for one kind of authority often is manifested in a lack of respect for others as well. Will the Lord be able to recognize the church that he built when he returns to take the kingdom back to God? There are many obvious religious errors that can be addressed by going back to the Bible and examining its teachings. In recent days, we've all seen how liberalism has damaged the church of our Lord in many and varied ways. To combat liberalism and all that it involves, one only need go back to the Bible and ask for the old paths where the good way is, Jeremiah 6.16. What we've seen in our time is the erosion of Bible authority in all areas of concern, from the plan of salvation to the worship of God, to the organization of the church, to morality in the flesh. In our day, we see churches that accept denominational baptism, modern-day Holy Spirit baptism. Many congregations have added various things to the worship of God to include instrumental music and praise teams, performance singing, responsive reading, baby dedications, children's church, small groups, and other ideas that all have one thing in common. You know, brethren, back in 1906, we all said, and most of the brethren and most of the history books say, that the cause of division was the instrument. No, it wasn't. The cause of division ends the same cause today. No Bible authority. The organization of the church has been attacked in many ways. Some congregations that are shepherdless have chosen not to upset the status quo and don't appoint elders even when men are qualified. 
Some appoint men that do not meet the minimum qualifications given in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 8 and Titus 1, 5 to 10, either in the idea that that's only an ideal and one can't and we can't really satisfy it, or that men will just simply grow into the job. Some have otherwise qualified men, but believe that the elder's authority is only in their example and not in their oversight. There are congregations that practice what's called evangelical oversight. That's something we ran into in Virginia several times. And basically the idea there is that the preacher is the last word on authority and he oversees the elders. Some falsely believe that deacons are a form of junior elder. And that they have oversight over physical matters while the elders have oversight over spiritual ones. And I don't remember ever reading that the deacons have oversight over anything. One of the doctrinal matters, of course, of our time is the reevaluation and reaffirmation of elders where sitting elders are, that are still qualified have to be reelected, just like the people we put into public office. And we know how well that works. Even while many can see the issues and problems with what we call church doctrine, they are surprised to hear how some congregations have gone off on morality as well. Many accept into their membership today those in unscriptural relationships, those who've had multiple spouses without scriptural cause for separation and are accepted in many congregations. Church discipline is seldom practiced and those known to be involved in fornication, adultery, alcohol consumption, and yes, even homosexuality are given a pass. Mixed swimming and dancing is now acceptable with many. One congregation in Virginia that uh, Daniel and I are both aware of had a dance before, we, before I left there. And they said that they would get out and do those dances as the Spirit moved them. There's not one issue that has not plagued the Lord's church in modern times with the possible exception of the one that plagued the church in the apostles' time, and that's circumcision. One wonders when that one's going to raise its head again. It is of interest, though, that even sound congregations who frequently discuss the sins of such unscriptural practices still do not put a great deal of emphasis on the issues of covetousness and greed. Blistering sermons are preached about fornication, Adultery and homosexuality, often citing 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Great emphasis is placed on those passions of the flesh while little attention is placed on those who are covetous. We almost say that in a hushed tone so that it's not too obvious. It's not too loud. We don't want to mention that word too much. Why do you think that is? Could it be because being Americans, we live in a country where success is praised and highly valued? We live in a nation where it's not uncommon to hear expressions like greed is good or show me the money. And at worst, we just think it's funny when people say stuff like that. Even our most recent election, once again, was focused on the pocketbook rather than on the very soul of our country. There were many things listed on the platform statements of both parties in last November's election, but one thing that was mentioned in every speech the one thing that was talked about right up until the final moments of the campaign was the economy. The problem is that there are many more important things happening in our society today than the economy. But most Americans run like blind lemmings headlong into a deep crevasse of moral degradation while wholly unaware that righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14:34. The great divide over the political platforms was not over how money was spent, but over the moral fabric of our nation. 
The subjects of same-sex marriage and abortion were in both platforms, one party being fully in favor of it and one party being fully opposed to it. And that was enhanced by the fight on the floor of the Democratic National Convention over the inclusion of God in their platform statements. Brethren, there is only one path to true economic health, and that is the one that recognizes God first and foremost as the source of all our blessings. Now that's true both nationally and personally. You know, I could have taken a lot of directions with this lesson. I started off to make it personal, but then after the election I decided I was going to change my focus and point out the fact that righteousness exalts a nation and that the Bible tells us that if we seek God, and his, God first and his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. That's true both personally and nationally. Government's role, as spelled out in the Declaration of Independence, is to provide the necessary safety and security for its people to be able to maximize their ability to maintain life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's never been government's job to provide jobs, move economies, or have anything at all to do with the flow of money, contrary to Maynard Keynes and his Keynesian economic theories. One's hard-pressed to show that anything currently being done by our government domestically has any constitutional authority at all behind it. As a matter of fact, some have pointed out, and they're right, there's no constitutional authority for income tax. But that's never been government's role. Jesus spoke many times on the subject of materialism. The words that he spoke have at least at times been misinterpreted. Jesus didn't condemn those that are rich, but rather those that are not rich toward God. One of the misunderstood passages, Matthew 19, 24, Jesus said, again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. What we have in this verse, and one of the problems that can frequently exist, was brought up yesterday, is a failure to read context. Because the next two verses add a dimension to the discussion. When the disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The problem is not wealth but rather materialism, defined as the love of material wealth. People can be wealthy without loving wealth. Which brings to mind another often misquoted verse, 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now notice it's not the money, but the love of it. That is the root of all kinds of evil. People misquote this all the time. Now, as we all know as gospel preachers, all of us that are, there are those and will be those who by reason of properly applied biblical principles will grow wealthy while never having the love of wealth that some have. We've even all known some preachers of the past that have grown wealthy and never have that love of wealth. Often these folks will give more to the work of the church than others because they fully recognize that these benefits are provided to them by God and no other. What's sad, however, is how many works of the church, good works, fail because of funding. I know that in his lifetime, Brother Ira Rice had a problem raising funds to, in order to do mission work and went all over the country in, in efforts to do that. Now, while I realize that we live in difficult economic times, such times are best weathered by putting our faith in God than in any other thing we might do. Notice what the Lord has taught us through his divinely inspired apostles. 2 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 6, reads, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. But notice this last verse. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things 
may have an abundance for every good work. Truly, God is able to provide for those who are willing to support every good work. Where's our faith? On the other hand, we must not place too much emphasis on those who give because they have much. Remember that the widow only had two mites, but the Bible says she gave more than all because it was all she had in Mark 12, verse 43 and 44. Some years back, I preached for a congregation in Missouri. Some of you have heard this tale. I was there five months. The building was closed for almost a month because of weather. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what I walked into. I discovered real quickly that they weren't a good fit, and I wasn't a good fit because they were looking for a sound congre- or I was looking for a sound congregation. They were looking for a liberal preacher. And I'm not talking about liberal Kansas. The decision was made that I terminate my association with them, but the elders told me I could continue to live in the house and receive funds to keep my family fed while I look for another work. You know, sadly, though, this happened exactly twice. When I was told by one of the elders that he had polled, that was his words, polled those members who gave the most and that they had decided that was the last check I would receive. Not only did that make their agreement with me a lie, it implied that those who gave less were less important to the work there. One of my first works was in a congregation that was predominantly military. Now, for those of you that have never worked in a military congregation, there are certain aspects of that that are quite a bit different. Among other things, one of the things that's really different is that your population changes all the time, especially when you have Well, when you have liberals in Congress and in the presidency, uh, I was uh, working in that congregation under the Clinton administration. And a lot of you heard about the base closings. Well, that didn't just affect those that closed. Ours didn't close, but our entire mission shifted. We watched a congregation of about 70 dwindle to the teens almost overnight. But another incident that happened that really stood out to me in this preparing this lesson is the fact that when you're in a military congregation, everyone knows how much money others are making because these are all published in a published pay scale. During a promotion cycle, nearly half of our members received promotions, put on their new rank, began receiving more money in their paychecks, Shortly thereafter, several new vehicles showed up in the parking lot and new clothes began to be worn at all services. Our budget increased not one red cent. Now, brethren, this is at a time when I was working full-time secular work because the congregation just couldn't afford a preacher on a full-time basis. I was receiving a stipend for my work our budget at that congregation was, was, was minimal because the building had been paid for a long, long since. And the largest part of the, of the budget was utilities. Now, brethren, it's not wrong for us to reap the benefits for the work that we do. This should not, however, be the primary goal behind our labors in the secular world. We have to keep in mind that God asked us for the firstlings of the flock, Nehemiah 10.36, and the best that we can contribute, Numbers 10.23. Too often folks contribute the leftovers and the second hand. Many wait until Saturday night or Sunday morning to decide how much they're going to contribute based on how much money they have left at the end of the week. But in fact, God requires that we purpose what we are to give, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, which we read a moment ago, and that that should happen as we are prospered, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. That requires, oh, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to use this awful, horrible word, budgeting. I say it's awful and horrible because most people don't do it. Most people don't have a clue what a budget is. They just know that they get money in and they put money out and... They don't know what happens to it. 
Now, I'm going to say this. One of the most unpopular topics a preacher can preach about is the topic of giving. No matter what one says, there will be those that hear him and will take some position or another contrary to what was said and often misunderstanding the point entirely. I preached a sermon in, uh, in Canada one time after being asked to preach it by the men, and I was, they wanted me to cover the budget. Well, this was a congregation that had a pretty healthy bank account. And when I say healthy, I'm talking about roughly $140,000 sitting in a bank account that nothing was designated for. They didn't even have a building fund because the building was all brand new, freshly refurbished, and, and this kind of thing. So we had this meeting, and we decided we were going to experiment a little bit with our budget. And they asked me to preach a sermon. So I got up, and I preached a sermon. And in the course of preaching that sermon, I said, and I, we went to 2 Corinthians 9, and I said, now, brethren, I said, if, if our men decided to take every dime in our bank account and spend it this year on benevolence, on evangelism, and on edification, I could support that. Because the Bible says that God is able to provide all sufficiency in all things that we may have in abundance for every good work. Now, things get misunderstood and misinterpreted. At the next business meeting, one of the men came in and he had four notes in his pocket from some of our elder widow ladies. And every one of those notes read the same way with the same beginning words. Since Skip wants to spend all the money in our budget, now, it's evident that I did not say that. But that's what some people hear when you talk about giving. When I'd only been a Christian a couple of years, the preacher began a sermon on the subject of giving, which had been assigned by the elders. In the middle of this sermon, a young man who was a newer Christian than I was stood up and loudly chastised the preacher publicly and stormed out. This demonstrates that there's a certain depth of feeling when the subject of giving is approached. As mentioned earlier, a preacher may get many an amen when preaching about the evils of fornication and homosexuality and adultery and drunkenness and cigarette smoking and drug abuse and the like. But the same preacher, when addressing the need to give more, will hear the old adage, well, preacher, now you've done it. You've quit preaching and gone to meddling. The lesson that we need to learn from the Lord, both personally and nationally, is the one given during his Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew 6, 31, 33. Seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness are a prerequisite to getting God's providence both personally and nationally. We can only hope, as we look to the future, that our nation will indeed recognize the need for righteousness in order to gain the providence of nature's God and prosper in both physical and spiritual blessings. I wanted to take just a moment and talk for my closing moments. I've, I'm actually a little ahead of time, which I'm surprised about, but, but that's okay. Having worked in both Canada and England, I've watched with dismay as these so-called democratic countries have limited the ability of gospel preachers to preach the truth on such subjects as homosexuality under the blanket of hate speech. How long will it be before our own government enacts similar laws? Brethren, I carried on in Canada for a period of almost a year, a publicized newspaper debate with the head of the Gay Pride Committee in my community. And we went back and forth on the subject many times. We covered a variety of areas. 
It really started for me the day that he said that homosexual wasn't even in the Bible till 1947. I said, you know, so I wrote a letter to the editor. I said, basically, you know, here's the situation. I said, you can play games with the words. Dinosaur wasn't in the Bible either. But that's because the word didn't even come into play until the 1800s. I think you can play those games, but Romans chapter 1 says what it says, and I quoted it. I said, what do you call that if you don't call it homosexuality? Men with men doing that which is unseemly, burning in their lust for one another. Even the women left off the natural use. What, what do you call that? Well, he gave that argument up. Then over time, he began to give up more arguments. He tried to pull the old we're born that way argument on me. And, uh, you know, unfortunately for him, I've done a little bit of study in science. And, you know, and I just went back to the studies that were done and showed that they weren't scientifically based studies to begin with. But it's interesting. You can't argue with the truth. Did you ever notice that? You cite Bible to people. They don't know what to say to you because you, you just can't argue with the truth. If I were in Canada today, I'd be in prison for doing the same thing. My good friend and brother Keith Sisman in England has talked about some of the problems they run into over there. There are things they can do, but they cannot openly preach and publicize that they're against homosexuality in any, in any sense of the word. The one thing that he and, his, he and his son did one time that I thought was particularly amusing was there was two homosexuals sitting across from them in the, in the, in the tube. With, yeah, that's a subway in England, by the way. And they knew they couldn't say anything. So what Keith, and Keith started doing was he started poking fun at them. And they got so upset that they got off the tube. <laughs> but as our constitutional rights get eroded, by encroaching government. Our concerns are justified in seeking appropriate redress. You know, at times there is nothing like a good rallying cry to get folks involved. In the past, concerns over the Second Amendment brought one such cry to the public eye. Our concerns as Christians, while still focused on the recent encroachments on the Second, Fourth, Sixth and Tenth Amendments should place far more emphasis on the first as government seeks to limit our freedom of religion and speech. And you know it's interesting because our rallying cry need not change from the one spoken a few years ago, but the subject matter should. With apologies to the late great Charlton Heston from my cold dead hands. Thank you, brethren. Thanks, Skip. Excellent lesson. We do appreciate what he said to us today, and everything he said is very true and gives us something to think about. But I will say I've been surprised now twice. I was first surprised when uh, Brother Danny was talk in his prayer saying about young Brother Francis. And then when Skip said that he was ahead of himself, that's the first time I've seen Skip with a shortage of words. Has anybody ever seen Skip having a shortage of anything and anything to say? I was surprised. I told Ken Chumley, I said, uh, it's like one of those shows on TV one time. Yeah, I'm having a big one. <laughs> The Bible teaches us to give honor to whom honor is due, and uh, I'd like to do that before we close today. Uh, Brother Ken Chumley, come on up here. And bring your cell phone. <laughs> you remember last night, David pulled this out about these cell phones, and I believe one went off today. Just go on and bring it up here and let us take care of it and make an example of you. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. So how about I break one and you break the other? 
I can do both of them then. It'd be fun. Or we can set them up. Uh, I believe we've got some that's got some other type of irons in here this morning. We could set them up in the back and do some target practice. <laughs> All right, well, we've got about 15 minutes. We're going to close, give you a break for the next 15 minutes. If you would be back in at the top of the hour.